My name is Val Leitner, and I am recording Steve Stancic and John Caldwell as part of the Sam Proctor Oral History Program Seahorse Key Marine Lab series. And this oral history is also for the UF and Public Humanities grant. So thank you gentlemen for joining us today. And uh, I know that you all have a lot to talk about with how you came to Seahorse and being graduate students out here. And uh, so I will let the two of you go for it from the beginning. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, let me uh, go ahead and get started. Um, I'm John, by the way. Um, growing up on a farm in Iowa, as I said earlier, in, in one of the, the walkabouts we did, I, I think I was kind of enamored with marine biology uh, through watching uh, the TV series Sea Hunt, which was an early early TV series about this guy. He was a marine uh, biologist, diver, and uh, I finally came up with the name. His name was uh, Lloyd Bridges, uh, double hose regulators, that sort of thing. But the, I thought that was kind of neat, but I, I think the truth of the matter is, is I had a biology uh, instructor in high school, which is when I took biology in high school, that was, uh, just got me really hooked on biology of all things. And gee, wouldn't this be fun if I was a biologist and then could be a marine biologist? So um, <clears throat> I went to undergraduate school at Northeast Missouri State University, which uh, still was about uh, 2,000 miles away from any coastline. But I wanted to get my undergraduate degree there in biology and then go somewhere else. Well, as luck would have it, I had a biology professor by the name of Will Seltzer, who I think took a summer course down here uh, with Elo Pierce, and, he, and I talked with him after class one day. He said, well, if you want to go into marine biology, John, you ought to consider the University of Florida, and if you want to go there, I'll write you a nice letter of recommendation, and I'm sure Elo Pierce would uh, recognize me and remember me and uh, might help you to get in there. So long story short, that's where I applied. As it turns out, Elo, I think, retired <clears throat> a year or two before I got here, uh, and uh, Frank Maturo was here. Uh, but that's basically how I got from a landlocked, uh, landlocked undergraduate uh, state like uh, Missouri to, uh, to Florida, and in particular, the University of Florida. Uh, Will, Dr. Seltzer had spent uh, a very pleasant summer here um, taking a marine biology course, and he said, once you get there, he said, it's the most pristine, uh, coastal uh, marine uh, biology area you're going to come across and uh, you'll really like it if you go to school there. So that's what brought me to Gainesville, Florida. Well, similar story. I was a lad from the square state, as my friends called it. Um, I went to the University of Colorado. I always wanted to be a biologist. Um, and the call of the unknown was marine biology, of course. So when it was finally time to um, apply to graduate school, I applied to Stanford, uh, University of Washington, Duke, um, University of Miami, Florida State, and Florida. And the only one that accepted me was Florida. So there was the, either going to graduate school or going to Vietnam. It was 1968. So. I hopped in my little car and drove to Florida. And after I got here, I had gotten, I had a similar teacher at the University of Colorado that taught invertebrate zoology. And I got my best grades in invertebrate zoology, even though he was, the students called him the smiling assassin because he was a real nice guy, but boy, did he grade hard. And I did really well, so I thought, okay, invertebrate zoology would be really cool. And I didn't know anything about faculty or how to find a faculty member or any of that. And I got here, and the graduate students were wonderful. They really took me under their wing. Um, I had, most graduate students at that time wouldn't come to school unless they had an assistantship, but I didn't have an assistantship. So I knew I was only going to be able to afford to go for a semester or two unless I got a good, un, an assistantship. And at that time, they had screening exams. So all the new graduate students 
had to spend two weekends taking these intensive exams in different areas of biology. And I was the only one without an assistantship and I was the only one that passed three of the five exams. So then all the faculty started talking and I got an assistantship working with a, a, a dean who is retiring and coming back to the lab. Um, as far as getting to know Frank, I didn't have a professor, so the guy who I shared an office with, his professor was Frank Nordley, who's an limnologist. And he, he told me, he's a really nice guy, why don't you go work with Frank Nordley? So I finally went and asked Dr. Nordley if he'd be my major professor. And he, he agreed to. Um, but after that, I took advanced invertebrate with Maturo and I really wanted to do invertebrates. And Elo Pierce had just retired. And finally, Maturo wrote me a note saying, if you want to do marine work, you probably should be working with either Elo Pierce or myself, not Nordley. Well, as a brand new graduate student, that really put me in a turmoil. How am I going to tell Nordley that I want to switch to another student? Oh, God. I was so scared. I sweated about it for a couple of weeks and finally I went into Dr. Nordley and said I think I probably should work with Frank Mature and he said yeah fine okay <laughs> he didn't give a rip <laughs> so that's how I ended up up with Maturo and I liked all biology and it was so fun knowing all of these natural history oriented graduate students they worked on fish they worked on reptiles and all we did was talk biology and most of us weren't married so we just spent all our waking hours in our labs or in the hallway talking to one another um, and I finally got an assistantship with Archie Carr and I didn't even know who Archie Carr was at the time and started reading his books and just became fascinated with it and in the summers I got to go to Tortuguero to work on turtle tagging for Carr and that's why it took me a couple years to figure out what I wanted to do. And the way I came up with a subject was um, Maturo finally said, you've got to work on something. Let's go out to Cedar Key. And he talked to me about how I really had to make a decision all the way out here on the drive. And we went to a little place called Goose Cove over by the airport. And we walked out there and waited out. And he said, dig down in this mud and see what you find. And I pulled up a brittle star and he said what's that it's a brittle star what do you know about it nothing why don't you work on that so that's how I started working on brittle stars and uh, soon learned that there there was a key to the echinoderms of seahorse key echinoderms are starfish and brittle stars and sea cucumbers and sea urchins um, that was written by a guy named Tom Hopkins who is about 10 years older than I was and so I started using that key and found out there were a number of different kinds of brittle stars so I did my master's thesis on their reproductive biology on the seasonality of their reproduction and that's how I got started. You know you triggered a memory or two of mine <clears throat> one of the things I did that I think that kind of really didn't get me to the University of Florida but really um, solidified my interest in marine biology. Uh, one uh, frozen winter day in uh, the Midwest, I was perusing the bulletin board in college and uh, there was a marine invertebrate course offered at the University of Oregon. And uh, so I, I sent in for it and uh, applied for it and got accepted. And so my junior year in college, I jumped in my Volkswagen, drove myself from Iowa to Oregon and spent a memorable summer uh, one year off from the summer of love <clears throat> down in Berkeley <laughs> at the University of Oregon's Marine Station and then then I knew that uh, that was what I wanted to do and coupled with Dr. Seltzer's recommendation for coming here uh, kind of got me here to start with. Um, also realize uh, uh, Steve touched on it uh, the time we were the times we were here when we first got here uh, a lot of turmoil in the country then because the country was heavily involved in the Vietnam War. And um, we all had exemptions uh, 
to go to college, uh, but I was in, I don't know about you, Steve, but I was in the first year of the lottery. And I drew a high number, and I thought, well, this will let me go to graduate school. But uh, in a small Iowa board, the first month, they went through uh, half all their numbers, and I thought they were going to get to me. So I was trying to figure out, how am I going to get, I'd been accepted to the University of Florida, how am I going to get to school? Well, the only alternative was to join ROTC and, and commit. So I spent the summer before I got here uh, marching around the hills of Fort Knox in uh, mm -hmm. Army basic training and uh, get out of that and come here. And then uh, uh, unusual program, uh, you went as a civilian so you could go home at any time. But, you know, the minute you left and got tired of it, then they draft you, you'd become uh, 1A and they draft you. So. Came back here and I was going to sign up and uh, the weekend before I called my dad and said check with the draft board see if they're going to draft me and they said no we're not going to so I dropped army and I had more time to spend on my studies then mm. but uh, a tumultuous time. Uh, Steve and I have talked about being in Flint Hall. My wife and I raced through the parking lot one night getting to my sand dollars up there that I was working on as the tear gas, can uh, tear gas canisters were popping all around us because mm. the riots on campus and that sort of thing. And uh, well, It was uh, kind of a scary time uh, yeah, I around had very most college similar, campuses in those days. It's very similar to me. I was going to be drafted as soon as I graduated. Um, that was two years before the lottery. Um, so I came out here the first thing I did was change my draft board to Jacksonville, and that took several weeks. Um, then I joined ROTC, and then I quit ROTC, and then I went to Jacksonville and took my physical, and uh, then the lottery came in and I had a high number. Mm -hmm. So I just missed getting drafted. Yeah, It was a really tough time. I never got any involved in any of the um, the demonstrations or riots or anything like that. I no, we were all too busy doing that sort of thing. But, you know, I, I think in terms of uh, how uh, the University of Florida students were viewed, that all kind of led to a little bit of the cultural differences that became really apparent once you got out of Gainesville a little bit. Uh, not yeah. necessarily the hippies and the rednecks, but, uh, uh, you know, we were all known as kind of the the, the rioting uh, crowd, yeah, I yeah. guess. And, uh, they're certainly the hippies. You yeah. know? I had a big wide watch band and a, <laughs> and a mustache. I stood out once you got outside of, outside of Gainesville. That's true. But the really neat thing for me, it really sealed it, was being able to come to Seahorse. Because once I've, I had been here with classes and on field trips, but never really stayed. And then when I started to do my research and had to set up stations and collect, I would come out here in, for days at a time and usually be the only person out here. And it was just a phenomenal adventure. Um, also, the caretaker, A.D., um, he wasn't very much older than us and he was a very talkative guy. And he knew how to do stuff. And I'd learned a lot about how to do stuff when I worked on the railroad. I knew what a wrench was and all that stuff. But A.D. taught me a tremendous amount, especially about motors and boats and how to drive boats. Um, and I'd be out here. The, sort of the cross that graduate students had to bear at that time was reprints. Reprints are articles, or reprints of articles in scientific journals and you always had a stack of reprints I've seen something once that said you know you're a graduate student if you take reprints to a bar um, and I always had reprints so if I well, wasn't who, out who sampling wouldn't, who, wouldn't yeah, do who wouldn't do that <laughs> if, if I did wasn't sampling I was sitting in here or sitting up in the tower reading reprints and watching I mean, it was so beautiful. There were birds everywhere. I had just gotten into bird watching, so it, it was just a phenomenal existence. And I still remember watching the sunset down on the beach and thinking to myself, I'm never going back to Colorado. And wrote my parents that night and said, I've got Florida sand in my shoes. Hmm. 
Well, and, and you know, I, uh, that's interesting about AD willing to work with you because when I got here, I think we, there were so many people here that, that summer it kind of overwhelmed him uh, for an island that he'd been here and kind of been in charge of and, and uh, he and he and his wife are the only ones here. Uh, there was a little bit of a rub there at times, uh, especially when you bring in someone uh, from uh, New, jo New Jersey who yeah. liked to uh, uh, tell him what to do. And, and uh, so there was uh, some cultural differences that, that he had to overcome. My, my time here, uh, I would come and spend time, but it was doing some sampling and sand grain sorting because I had to, my deal was I, I worked on substrate selection in uh, sand dollars, and I, I was raising sand dollars, and I had a electric, I need ele needed electricity full time to stir them, so I would come and collect sand dollars out on sand point, and I'd either, well, that first summer of 71, after we got married and we spent the whole summer here, uh, I would haul them into a town to a, an office or a place I had rented, and then little petri dish, you turn them upside down, inject them in the mouth with uh, potassium chloride, and uh, if, if they made purple, they were the girls. If they made white, they were the boys. And you just run a toothpick through the white and run it through the eggs, and you had little sand dollars, a little uh, uh, sand dollar larvae here pretty soon. And I'd transfer them, and, and so you didn't overcrowd them. But I needed, they had to be constantly stirred to kind of mimic the... Uh, uh, Gulf currents, the water currents they were in, and and uh, so I needed I needed power. So I'd come and collect, and I'd come over here, and so it was I was almost commuting there on a daily basis from here over there. Yeah. Once I got things, and then during the year it would be just to come out to collect and 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 come back. But I had to. Uh, sand dollars, uh, you probably don't realize they're rather excitable animals, so you had to pack them carefully and. Uh, wet paper towels and put them in a cooler and keep them nice and cool and or or uh, uh, you you get them back to Gainesville and it's too late because they'd already had their reproductive party and right. they'd have to start all over. It's again. sort of it's sort of like they were thinking, I'm about to die. I better reproduce. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> it's now or never. Um, my animals, I collected them and preserved them, and then I would go home and analyze things. So. Most of the time I was out here, I was collecting animals and preserving them, and then if the tide, when the tide was in, I couldn't work or do that sort of thing. So Yours were a lot harder to find than mine, too. Much oh, more secretive. I can't maybe. believe how much effort I had to spend. They're sneaky I, level, little devils. Well, I already talked about how I would have to collect huge tubs of mud off the beach. Another one of my stations was at Grassy Key, which is between here and Cedar Key, just a little tiny island. And I would take 20 or 30 buckets and take the boat to Grassy Key and fill those buckets with sediment, which weighed the boat down so much that it would go about a half a mile an hour. And then I would come back to the island. Sometimes that was pretty nice because when there were evening tides, um, this place, when it's calm in the evening, it's absolutely beautiful and the sun's going down and the I always thought of the ocean or the water being like strawberry ice cream mm -hmm. because you would have this beautiful pink sky reflected in the water and it flat calm and you'd just be driving your boat slowly slowly through that. Now if you'd add uh, gentle tropical breezes wafting to the palm trees. <laughs> That's right, it was you had the substance of how I convinced right. my wife to come live here right. the first time. Plus the fact that you were moving, so you weren't getting eaten alive <laughs> by the sand flies. <laughs> right. <laughs> and once yeah. you get back to the dock, then it's get your work done as quickly as possible mm. so you can get away from the biting insects. That time of the evening was beautiful, though, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm. But we had no electricity, so the the stoves and the refrigerators were propane. And so you could refrigerate stuff. Um, and then just the kerosene lanterns were the light we had. Um, summer nights got pretty, pretty harsh because the flies could get right through the windows and it would be so hot and sweaty. But you're on an island all by yourself and it was just fascinating. Well, thing to by do. the time we got here, I got here and spent that summer of 71, we had the generators. You didn't have generators mm -hmm. early on. And AD didn't live on the yeah. island until that summer. Oh, okay. That was the first summer. All right. 
Yeah, and I, I mean, we could cook. I, I, my favorite recipe, but best thing to do out here was basically I would have a can of cream soup, can of tuna fish, a can of mixed vegetables, and elbow roni. And I would cook the elbow roni, mix it all together, stir it up and heat it, and you could eat it for three days. <laughs> and it was perfect graduate student student meal. Yeah, it met the budget too, right? Uh, yeah, <laughs> met the budget, met the budget yeah. for yeah. sure. So, and if there were a couple of you out here, there was a group of four or five of us, John and myself, a fellow named John Page, a guy named Mike Osterling, Tom Rudiger, the guy from New Jersey, um, that were all doing work out here at the same time. So sometimes there'd be two or three of you out here uh, and you would cook together and and talk. On the weekend, and the wives, their wives would come out. Sometimes the wives would come out here. on the weekend. Yeah. Um, other times you were here all by yourself, and it was just wonderful. Yeah. Let's see. So I have here some of your papers that you did. I don't know if you would want to talk about these in particular. You don't have to, but. Um, I don't even know if you remember uh, these documents or um, or what course they were for. Or I remember one of them, um, but this this first one is titled "A Consideration of the Interstitial Fauna of a Sandy Beach," and that was done in Dr. Maturo's Advanced Invertebrate Zoology class. One of mine was done for that class too. So. And I didn't know anything. Actually, I think when I was at Colorado, I had done a little paper on interstitial fauna. Those are animals that live in the sand. They're all, they're all invertebrates. They're tiny, microscopically tiny, and they live between the sand grains. They're, the name for them is myofauna. And they're a whole diverse phylum of obscure, or diverse groups of obscure phyla like tardigrades and nematodes and copepods. So I did, this was basically a library research paper. The other one is a report on the ascidians, which are tunicates, collected in um, that same class. And I remember that for that class, we would go, Dr. Matro would take us to different marine laboratories and we would collect. And each laboratory, among the 10 or 11 students, you would be responsible for one phylum. So we went to Sapelo Island, Georgia, and I was responsible for echinoderms. We went to Crescent Beach, and it was polychaetes. And when we came to Cedar Key, my group was the ascidians, the tunicates. And it turned out, I didn't know it at the time, I actually volunteered to do the tunicates, that um, they're extremely hard to identify to species. You have to do things on, a, on an animal that's one millimeter long, you have to look under the scope and see if the vast deference is coiled clockwise or counterclockwise around the testes. You know, and, things. and it also turned out, as I got into the library, that this was a hotbed of ascidians. And there was actually a National Museum publication, the Fishhawk Expedition of the Ascidians of the Northern Gulf that was done here. Mm -hmm. So there was a huge diversity of these animals. And that was a, I remember that because that was such a difficult paper to write. And I have hated Ascidians ever since. <laughs> well, looking over these, I'd forgotten all about these, Steve, but I think you'll you agree with me, this is probably some of the most brilliant science of its time <laughs> ever, ever, right. ever put together. I mean, who wrote this stuff? Well, and I typed it. I mean, you can see it's I typed all typed. It. I've got, I've, mine even has white out on it. Ooh, what is that? Yeah, yeah this was, uh, one of these is, uh, I was working on uh, my sand dollars, Melita Quinquay's perforata, which I misspelled. I see it got corrected. But it... Uh, <clears throat> Low salinity effects, and I I, I, uh, I proved without a doubt that in one generation you can't make freshwater sand, sand dollars. 
But uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting to, to look at. That was part of Frank's course. Gosh, look at this hand-drawn grass. Yeah, these grass. Yeah. yeah. And then this other one was a laboratory study, probably the same course. Polychaetus annelids of the Gulf Continental Shelf. So I looked, these are uh, essentially marine worms. Yep. Of the marine shelves. So it was so different then because everything was done. I mean, a lot of the papers, a lot of students hand wrote their papers. I couldn't write worth a darn, so I learned to type very yeah. early in my high school career. Yeah. I had a typewriter. I that was typed a everything. High school graduation present was a typewriter because I couldn't write, so anyone could read. And and guess what? Um, hard to correct. Yeah. Uh, word processors were very primitive then. Came in a bottle. Um, and and uh, you know, uh, internet. Now what's that? Uh, yeah. Your you, your library research was were hard copy books in the library. There was a big computer center on campus, and you had to. Punch cards. Steve talks about reprints. We then, spent fortunes on Xerox machines at what, nickel a copy or something, copying reprint after reprint after and, reprint. And writing to the authors for reprints. Yeah, try to get free you ones. Know, try to get free reprints. Nowadays, if you're an author, well, of course it's electronic, but even when there were reprints, you had to pay for the reprints. You know, at that time, they just gave you 50 or 100 reprints if you published a paper. Yeah. And then you expected your colleagues to write you or you have a group of people that you would send reprints. So that's, nowadays you look on the computer, you get on the web, science web or something like that, and you can read all these papers. Um, but then it was all paper. And this is all hand done. All of our, our figures, you know, there was nothing like PowerPoint. I took a statistics course where we use slide rules. Mm -hmm to do our statistics. There was one calculator in the department. Dr. Nordley had a calculator hmm. that you chink. See if you were smart, you'd have stayed with him. Yeah. There yeah. you go, half access to the calculator. Yeah. So some things have been made easier, although I'm not sure computers have made life any easier. <laughs> well, the uh, information access certainly is. I mean, yeah. uh, but there's still a time sink. adjunct professor at uh, UF, I'm amazed uh, with a library access, what you can get online. I mean, everything. Everything. Period. Oh, and, the, and in invertebrate zoology, there are, there are uh, um, lots of technical ideas about different cell layers, endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. And at that time, a really good lecturer was a professor who could take red, yellow, and white chalk and draw on the black one-handed one -handed and draw a developing embryo or something like that with the three layers, you know. I had, to, I had to explain that for sand dollars at my master's defense and I had boxes that I poked holes in and everybody yeah. was laughing and of course they just piled on me. But <laughs> of course, and yeah. you're in your defense. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. One thing I noticed going through the student papers when we were <coughs> going through all and archiving all of the old documents, and these documents started, you know, from the beginning with 1952, 53. And there are many, many student papers, and undergrad and graduate. And uh, I noticed that, or, well, it, I have this hypothesis that if, um, if a student didn't know what project he or she would like to do for the course, that there were a couple of stock projects that they could do. Hmm. And uh, one of them seemed to be stomach contents. Uh, there were quite a few papers. Really? Where, yes, quite a few papers. And they were always, um, the papers were always very well attacked by whoever was grading. And so it seemed like maybe this was the straggling student who just, we'll just do stomach contents then, you know? Was, was when you all took courses out here, was it like that? Uh, were there projects that were assigned to you? Or was it, as you talked about before, where Dr. Maturo would allow you to, to go in your own direction? Well, certainly, like these taxonomic groups, like the Ascidians, that was assigned. Okay. You know, you basically, you put all the different phyla in a hat and you picked one out for every field trip and that's what you did. But others, you 
could pick your subject. Um, and I think the stomach content thing, at, at that time, people didn't know what a lot of these animals ate. So it was very descriptive, but it was new information. I mean, we're still finding that out, and we're still learning that animals are eating things we never realized, and the techniques, at that time, you'd open the guts, and you'd see what you could identify. Well, now that can all be done chemically. So you can take different groups of animals and take their proteins and inject them into rabbits, and the rabbits make antibodies. And then you can take gut contents that are pure liquid and cross-react them and see if they've been eating that because the proteins will cross-react with the antibodies. And they have found, for instance, that sandpipers are actually eating myofauna. They've got little furry tongues, and they're, when you see them sticking their beaks in the sand, they're picking up myofauna and organic matter. And so gut contents was a big deal. You know, in fact, the, my office partner, who was such a big help for me when I came here, Richard Fox, was working on the feeding behavior of a little sunfish called Eniacanthus gloriosus. And he would take me out and we would seine in all these little Florida ditches. And we had a big aquarium made out of refrigerator bottoms in our office. And whatever we seined up, we'd put in, the, put in the aquarium except for the fish he was studying. And he got, and turned out, those fish were eating primarily uh, little things that you may know of as beach fleas, but they're amphipods. And they were eating amphipods. And he got so interested in that that he ultimately did his PhD on amphipods. So gut contents were a big deal. So something else I noticed in those student papers is that in many of them, and I don't know if this was during your time or maybe it was afterwards, but it seems like there were two graders that uh, oftentimes Frank Maturo was a red pencil, and then there was somebody else who was very harsh, I mean, and, and didn't sugarcoat anything, who was a blue pencil. And I forget the name of that person. And so it seems like they both went through and graded and commented on student papers. Hmm. Did you all ever have that, or? Um, well, was it another? You couldn't tell who it was. Was it another faculty member? Because there was someone else that used to teach. Uh, Marine Bali. That was well. There was a guy, um, Bill Carr, way back. When, no, I was William thinking Carr. of. The Oh, he was a former dean who came back to teach. I can't remember. You mean two people grade in the same paper? Yes. Yeah. But each paper Did would Frank have, have a graduate red student? corrections and blue corrections. And the, and the handwriting would be different. And there was one paper, in fact, where, uh, where the two correctors interacted. And, well, it was Frank who backed the other corrector down to say that that comment is actually unfair. <laughs> huh. And so... And, and that was funny because when you, the, the, whoever was the blue pencil was very scathing sometimes mm -hmm. in the remarks. And so I was wondering if this was a common thing where you have two correctors for every paper. I really don't remember that. He might have had a graduate student. That could have been, that could have been Edith Humphreys. <laughs> yeah, it might have been Edith. <laughs> might have been Edith, his PhD student. Yeah. Um, but he would have, a, when he taught invertebrate zoology, a graduate student would teach the labs. Okay, so that might have been, he'd have the graduate student doing this kind of correction. I always used the red pen, so it wasn't me. <laughs> but I was, I, I'm a born editor, and I'm editing constantly. I can hardly stand to read the Gainesville Sun because there's so many errors in it. But um, I think he taught us very well how to write and that was a big deal then, learning how to write scientifically. Um, that was a big learning curve to do that. Mm -hmm. And those cor written corrections were real helpful. Did either of you ever teach a lab for Frank? I taught both advanced invertebrate lab and in, I, I taught invertebrate zoology lab for several years. I yeah. taught here. I at, did, at, yeah. But we only came out here for a field trip. We didn't stay out here. I never taught. He, he eventually started summer courses out here, but by that time I was already gone. Um, I, it was in the late 70s that he started doing yeah. that. I, I had been a, his graduate assistant in a 
on campus course a time or two for in, invertebrate zoology. I don't think ever advanced, but uh, as I recall, but uh, no, I did both of them. Um, and the, the way I look back now, um, professors have ways of saving their time. So in advanced invertebrate, instead of him lecturing, which that's what students did at that time. You were just a sponge. You, the teacher talked and you wrote. And that wasn't nearly as interactive as it is today. Um, but he would assign us groups. And then we would have to research and lecture on that group. So he wouldn't have to make the lectures up. We would make the lectures up. And, we, and he just had to sit and watch. Um, I've seen that more and more that was always in a, graduate work. That was always a challenge, yeah. But I mean, yeah. it was good experience. And you learned about a group, you know. You learned a lot about a group because you had to go. That's when Libby Hyman's books were so valuable because uh -huh. you'd find some. There was a, a woman who worked at the Chicago Museum. She started out basically as a secretary. Um, but she got very interested in um, invertebrates. First, she wrote a book on vertebrates. And then she decided to write treatises on various invertebrate phyla. Her name was Libby Hyman. Um, and she ended up writing seven volumes on the invertebrates on different groups. And it was just a, it, these treatises were voluminous compilations of everything that had been written about that particular Absolutely. Group. Uh, elegant diagrams and, and uh cutaways and excruciating detail. Uh, on everything. And everything you want to know. For us, those books were invaluable. And Dr. Maturo had a set of them. When I first got here, I started saving my money. And it, whenever I got enough money together, I'd get another volume. And I eventually got them all. And there was a, some strange tales about that. Um, but there weren't computers. There were books. And if you bought your own books, you could write in them and write in the margins and underline all that. And he, he actually told tales about when he was a graduate student, Libby Hyman was writing this, her book on the group called the Lophophorates, which three small phyla that have sort of feeding tentacles. And that's what he worked on. He worked on uh, one group called the Bryozoans. And he was at Duke University and she came there in the summertime, and all of these professors would want to sit with Libby Hyman and talk with her and pick her brain. And she would say, no, go away. I want to sit with Frank, the graduate student, because he's working on the animals I want to work on. <laughs> and he was very pleased about knowing Libby Hyman and having done that. She was dead by the time we were graduate students, but those books were invaluable. She had worked on sand dollars too. I remember Frank telling me uh, one time he was up there and, and in the teeth of a hurricane or in the face of a hurricane, she asked him to go out. She said, I flipped some sand dollars over out there and I'm not sure they can right themselves before this hurricane hits. Will you go turn them over? He said, Libby, I know they can turn themselves over <laughs> and that she wouldn't have it. So he got out there on the sand, sand spit and went and flipped the bat. I, with he, the, he probably didn't even find him. He just said, oh yeah, I got him. I took care of him. But with uh, the storm coming, with storm the coming. storm coming in. He told another tale about her. There's a group um, of burrowing worms called enteropneusts, and they dig deep, 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 five or six feet deep U-shaped burrows, and they're very soft-bodied. So to, to collect one is a really big effort. And he had gone out with her, and they had dug and dug and dug and collected an interop noose for her to draw because she was writing on that group of animals. And he said he remembered he was out on the dock. He was swimming out on the dock, and she came out with the interop noose. And she said, well, I'm done drawing it. I'm going to let it go and toss it in the water. And he was flabbergasted because he knew that some sheephead immediately was going to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was never going to get to burrow again. Yeah. <laughs> it was such a difficult to obtain animal. Yeah, she would hand sketch all those things. Right. All of her animals and keep those drawings for her book. It was uh, quite a set. So do you have any questions about the lighthouse? Certainly. Um, but while we're talking about Frank, 
Yes, I want to get to the lighthouse. While we're talking about Frank, do you all, would you like to tell any stories about Frank or talk about him as a, a mentor or any, any impressions that you have? As I'd like to talk, I'd, yeah, I'd like to do that. And I'd also like to talk a little bit about more some of the other things uh, uh, Frank got into that kind of involved me and, and uh, my, my career at UF. Um, I finished my master's, uh, started back into graduate school in a doctoral program in zoology, and I was, I was just kind of burnt out. And, and uh, Florida Power Corporation had come to Frank and said, you know, why don't you, you know, we, we want to give you a grant to do some work down at Crystal River at this new power plant we're building, would you do that? And he said, sure, and he talked to me, he said, would you do that? So we started looking at zooplankton down there, and uh, uh, the project kept growing and growing for a number of years. I didn't even I didn't go back to school. I was a full-time staff at UF, and uh, Frank had several hundred thousands of dollars of grants from Florida Power to do more kind of Im impact statements relative to that uh, power plant operation at Coastal uh, Crystal River, as H.T. Uh, Odom wants to describe them, large coastal oysters. Right taking things in, spitting them back out. So, um, <clears throat> the, the sociology of being a professor then, I mean, it's, it's evolved over time, but when he was a graduate student, professors didn't have to have a lot of money. The university would pay their research costs. They could write small grants. Any, anybody could write and get a National Science Foundation grant. And that evolved while he was a professor. That evolved so that it was harder and harder to get grants. And it was harder to get grants to do the kind of research he did, which was taxonomy, systematics, just identifying species. So in the university, in the biology department, people that were working on popular subjects got big grants. People that weren't got little grants or no grants. And they were looked down upon. And the other thing was that if you were really a good scientist, you got NSF grants to do pure scientists. But if you got money to do applied science, that was not good money. So there was that status thing too. And I think he always felt looked down upon by certain of the faculty. But for us, being his students, when he got those grants, all of a sudden, we had a whole lot more resources than we did before. Graduate students at that time, we didn't get any money either. And we would do basically what they did in the military. We would do midnight requisitioning and go into different people's labs and get, <laughs> get what we needed, <laughs> you know? You'd, you'd open the door to your professor's lab and they would go in and get some Petri dishes and they'd open the door to their professor's lab and you'd go get some pipettes and things like that. And that's just, we learned to do that, midnight requisitioning, and we were real, in my generation, to see professors that, that real hoarders, you know, that I still, I still have army surplus isopropyl alcohol from 1975 that I got it, that we had found in the basement at University of South Carolina. Really? And I still have it. Uh. <laughs> we kept everything because you never knew what you'd have to make to do your, do your work. Well, that's a good point. Yeah, the, the, the applied research end of things, uh, although it was really interesting to me and it provided a lot of resources, as Steve said, that graduate students, it's still in the basic biology um, areas of uh, zoology, it was kind of frowned upon, looked down upon, oh yeah, oh, yeah you're, you're not doing real science and that sort of thing. But it fueled my, well, as it turned out, it kind of fueled my career because I discovered I, I, I could have just as much fun doing those kinds of projects and being a project manager as I was uh, working with sand dollars or being more of a marine biologist. So it kind of, uh, and, and then that evolved uh, into a, a similar, once that wound down, uh, Frank got a call from the Department of Transportation, Florida Department of Transportation, uh, a former student that he knew for someone else that worked down at Crystal River and said, Frank, you got anybody that can work? We gotta, we gotta do a, we're gonna replace the bridges in the Florida Keys. You got anybody that wants to kind of look at the impact of that? So he said, John, are you interested? So 
that became my dissertation research. And for that, you focused on the seagrasses. Yeah, right? seagrasses. That's correct. And uh, I was I moved from zoology into environmental engineering. Then I did more computer modeling, although uh, we were in the field a lot. But it was more ecosystem type modeling and that sort of thing. That that was where I was what I was interested in. But again, um, a more applied aspect of. Uh, kind of basic research, if you will. Uh, Steve may not agree. No, that's, that's right. Basic about and at it, that time, the environmental engineering department yeah. had some really good biologists. H.T. Mm -hmm. Odom was an internationally mm -hmm. known um, ecologist. And Clay, Clay was a student then, right? Clay yeah. Montague. But yeah. there were some really good coastal engineers in mm -hmm. that department. And, and, and I, I think I was also realizing that academia was was never a place that I was going right. to want to call home, like Steve. Well, that was the other aspect that a lot of faculty at that time, if you weren't, if you were getting a PhD and you weren't planning on going into academia, then there was something wrong with you. That was, that was the only good profession, and I was very much that way. I, I wanted to stay in academia, but they were very close to applied research. Yeah. And that, that's all changed. That's all changed now. So, John, what was it like working with Frank in some of these uh, applied scenarios? Uh, uh, he was wonderful. I mean, uh, wonderful in terms of uh, he kind of let me do my own thing. I talked a lot with him. He was always amazed that I could do budgets and uh, Gantt charts and plan projects and that sort of thing. And he kind of let me do that. And we talked about direction. And uh, we kind of wrote our own scope of work, if you will, uh, what we were going to do that c was consistent with what uh, Florida Power in those days and then Department of Transportation uh, wanted us to do. I mean, they were they were fairly non-directive, but uh, uh, Frank and I worked worked well together, uh, although he just, you know, kind of left me alone. That was it was kind of his thing. And I, I would bounce ideas off of him and uh, sometimes uh, had to push him a little bit. And uh, Frank, I'm OK, I've been to the library. I've looked at this. Don't tell me to go back again. Let's let's talk let's about talk it, you know uh, where where we need to, to uh, you know what what's your gut or your common sense tell you? Because he'd say, well, I don't know too much about that. Well, I don't either, but you know, let's kind of figure it out together. And but he so. he built a really good team for that Crystal River project yeah. because there was a guy named Bill Ingram who was wonderful with statistics, and a guy named um, um, Ray Alden who did his Ph.D. on the copepods, mm -hmm. and Ray's now a provost at the University of Nevada, I think. Um, and he was a wonderful student. So there was a good team that Frank just sort of had to stand back and let them go. And he was, a, he was pretty laid back as a mentor. Yeah. He provided the opportunities, but he didn't tell you what to do. Yeah. I mean, at the time, it was a pretty large group. I had, that was probably one of the larger projects I had managed at the time, we had, I had 26 people working for me down there. And we were in the field, we had boats, we had big boats, we were running all over, taking plankton samples. We had a whole sorting processing lab down uh, mid, what's now Midtown, Gainesville. And uh, That's right. a little bit towards downtown, but anyway, and uh, yeah, Frank, we'd stop, right. stop by, and he, he just, uh, he was very encouraging, but uh, um, the, uh, other, the other um, essentially basic research coming there, out of there, like uh, Ray's dissertation and that sort of thing, it was really good stuff. It was really fat. I mean, nobody had done that kind of regular, long-term sampling of a plankton community before. Mm -hmm. and, and and to be able to analyze it, uh, I mean, we had a Wang 2200B, which would probably you know, rival, didn't rival the, the 360, 365 on campus, but uh, we did our own analysis and Bill wouldn't, did multivariate analysis and uh, really high-end statistical stuff. It wouldn't match your phone now. Oh, no, no. My phone's <laughs> much more powerful than that machine ever was, but uh, That's right. uh, it was kind of interesting. And Frank, Frank was just a gentle, I guess, quiet encouragement for that. Right. He was a very gentle person, but he provided us with lots of opportunities. Like we mentioned before that um, we would get to go on cruises 
And even the very first time Susio tried that sort of thing, they brought a boat into Cedar Key and because of his arrangements and anchored right out here in the channel and taught us all how to use oceanographic sampling equipment, which we had never seen before. There are things called inversion thermometers that you drop down to the bottom and then pull a switch and the thermometer turns over and it locks so you know what the bottom temperature is. And water samplers, all these different kinds of samplers that are used in deep ocean work. Frank arranged that opportunity. And then we would go on these cruises that would go out and come back, either leave from Tallahassee or Tampa or here and come back into the Keys. Um, and those weren't comfortable for him, but they were just treasure adventures for, for us students. And it was the same. When he, Elo Pierce retired, he became director of Seahorse. And as any new director, he wanted to do all kinds of things. And there was no money. And he had a very small budget. So we would go to Camp Blanding and look for surplus stuff and bring it out here. All the bunk beds were surplus. The generators were surplus. We would just, that was like midnight foraging. We would go every six months or so and see what they had that we could use out here. And he worked really hard to uh, especially supervise the caretakers who were basically young guys that had been brought up fishing and they knew a lot about how to fix a boat but they didn't know a lot about how to maintain stuff. You know, the way you fix things, the way you worked was you worked with it until it broke and then you fixed it. You didn't change the oil and all these other things. But they, all of those guys taught us graduate students tons of that kind of practical knowledge. And he was really good about trying to get support for this lab and build it up. It was a real struggle. The University of Florida just this was the poor stepchild, uh, marine land, whatever's going on over there, you know, Seahorse Key, well that, you know, that's right. nothing over there. He, I, he, so he, he, small budget, and he finally got some headway, I think, when he was able to get Seahorse Key under the Vice President for Academic Affairs, and uh, Bob Bryan, who was the Vice President then, kind of, that gave, gave the lab some more vi uh, vi uh, visibility, gave him a little more budget, you remember when that happened? Yeah, and, it, and it I, did make a difference. And he was—I think it helped. But that was that was Frank's doing, looking for, a, you know, as a as a, a piece of the department of zoology. There just wasn't much funding there. When you when you move that into something else, the whole college, the whole college, or something like that, then you you had more funding avenues too. So you know, this thing has been a, a seat of the pants. Uh, starving operation for a number of years. And Thankfully it's yeah. changed now. But. And he always wanted to build a lab on the mainland because everybody knew the shortcomings. You can't do any sophisticated science work out here without electricity and power and running water. So it's a field station and you come out and collect and maybe do a short-term experiment but you can't use an electron microscope or any of those chemical analyses things. So we always had a dream about building a lab on the mainland, and there is finally a lab on the mainland that was built last year. You know, and there's a lot of stuff going on with that because it's in under IFAS and, and Santa Fe, and it was supposed to be joint with Whitney Lab on the marine land side, and that's not working that way. But there is a lab where people can do research on the mainland now, which, which is always his dream. And we saw in the archives there was a extensive exploration of the university's Clark Island. That's mm -hmm. right. Can you all speak a little bit about that? That's where he wanted it to be. John remembers um, Frank working with somebody in the architecture department who made a student project to design a lab, and they actually built a model. That, that was Harry. That was Harry Merritt, who was a pretty well known local architect, but he had his graduate students working on that, and, and it was kind of a southern plantation style, two-story, lots of wide veranda type porches and that sort of thing on Clark Island. That that was kind of Frank's, and it was it was a beautiful physical model. They actually built a physical model uh, when they did their reviews. Uh, Harry invited uh, 
Frank and Frank invited me and, and they kind of treated us like the customers or the clients and uh, get our impressions and ask questions and we could ask questions about it. But it was, uh, yeah, Frank, Frank had in his mind's eye, he had, he had that pretty well set up in terms of what he wanted to do at Clark's Island. And he wanted dormitories because he had, he had gone to Duke University and Duke has a marine lab on an island and lots of dormitories and lots of summer programs where uh, researchers would come together and meet and you'd get to know all kinds of different people and that that was kind of his model the Duke University Marine Lab was sort of his model but basically he was never really able to get the funding for it yeah and I say I always knew that Steve had the million dollars he could have given them but he just, he just <laughs> yeah. I couldn't talk him into it to that's have. right right <laughs> so I think this map from one of the files shows. Yeah, well, here's the museum. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Where's the airport? Do you know about why that site in particular was selected? Um, the university already had it. Okay. That was, I don't know how they got it, but that was university property. I would look at it askance now because I think it could be easily flooded. You know, it's very low and flat land. Mm -hmm. I don't see the airport. The airport's right beside it. We, we, here's the airport. Oh, landing field. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he had that building. Harry had the building, uh, I think, oriented to it. It faced almost due west. And you, and it, across you wouldn't be able to bring boats into it or anything. And, of course, you would want almost to dredge a canal to it, but you couldn't do that. There's some paperwork, uh, you know, again, when I was going through the archival materials, I didn't read every document, but I remember uh, seeing documentation about them building a road out there mm -hmm. and them having to dredge a channel so that there, it was big enough to bring the Elo Pierce or the Discovery later in there. Right. Something along those lines. Well, now you couldn't do it anyway. You'd, you'd never get a permit to do that kind of thing. But in fact, the new building, the dock, is only there because the people that own that motel kept kept their right to have a dock even after the dock washed away. Mm -hmm. So they were grandfathered in basically. You couldn't just go and build a dock now. So and that was fortunate. Sorry, That's all. So uh, and on that the note of the, the boat, so John, here's some documents from the archives again uh, that you wrote when after the urchin sunk, the top document actually is the inspection report for the urchin uh, when it was decommissioned. And then the others are your documents. Like yeah, I'd forgotten about it. Apparently I went down and looked at a boat in Tampa for Frank. And there's a fabulous letter in there about two Navy boats. Um, oh, we, we, we looked at a PT boat one time. Really? <laughs> that had that, been about a three-minute trip from here to Cedar Key, <laughs> if your hair stayed on. Uh, <laughs> but, it, well, and directors of labs are still doing that. If, if they have any luck getting a drug runner's boat or some guy wants to finally unload his boat, he can donate it to a lab. Lots of time, if it can be used as a, a research vessel, they'll take it. YP uh, patrol craft. Okay, yeah, that was I think the the PT boat. So John, was this work that you were doing as a graduate student just to help Frank out? Because this seems more administrative. I think so. I think I just was around, and he asked me, "Would you help me with this?" Okay. Yeah, I didn't realize that Tom Emma was the acting director. I didn't know that either. University of Florida no, Marine Lab. It sure was. Tom well, that's, when, that's back when zoology was uh, in charge of it, so yeah, he was the uh -huh. acting director. So that would Huckins make research. Yeah, Frank would that. have been the assistant director because the department chair was the acting director. <laughs> the urchin sank. You know, there's a reference to a sea craft in there. Yeah, I, I think. see that. You did say we already have a my, my, one My one claim of notoriety is we replaced the engine in that sea craft, and I took it down, and we were doing some work at Crystal River again, and uh, I tied it up at the intake canal down there, and had it all buoyed off and that sort of thing, and then came up to watch a Gator football game, and the damn thing came loose, <laughs> submerged that brand new engine. Uh, Frank, <laughs> Frank was ready to kill me. He probably should have, yeah. but uh, 
Yeah, that's so we got that replaced. Problem. AD wants, we got a new motor. I mean, getting a new big motor was a big deal. And we got a new motor and AD mm. tried to take a shortcut back to Cedar Key and hit the flat and tore the whole foot of the motor up. And I mean, when you don't have any money, that was just that was pretty really hard. And yeah, no and, insurance. Yeah, no insurance. And, and frankly, I mean, what the old saying is, boats are holes in the water into which you throw money. No that, that's true. I mean, you know, these are pretty good sized vessels. They're not trivial 20 footers or something like that. And uh, boy, they're expensive. And how, how uh, Dr. Machuro kept them running with as many little money as he had and as many students that came out here. And I, I can't ever remember a time I was turned down for coming out here because, oh, well, we can't get you over the island. No. Nope. One way or another you got here. One way or another you got here. And often, you know, you would find there was a place which is now a condominium in Cedar Key, but it was a little marina. And that's where they'd tie up the boats. They kept them out here, but if they knew somebody was coming, the caretaker would bring a boat in and you'd get, you'd get to Cedar Key and find your boat there, fueled up and uh, load your gear in it and come on out. Um, it seems to me many, many, many times I would come out and come out here and do my work and everything was great. And then when it was time to go back, the wind would come up and it would be a really scary <laughs> trip back, you know, with the 20 knot wind blowing. One time I hit a wave and in these small boats and the bow went up and just spun me around. And all of a sudden I was facing the other way, you know, what happened? But AD once again taught me so much because I was one of the first ones out here that really used the boat and it was a little 12 foot skiff and I was from Colorado. I've never seen a wave bigger than that and they made me really, really nervous. And so one summer he said, okay, I'm going to show you that you can trust this boat. And we went out, there's a standing channel in Dead Man's Key, out by Dead Man's Key. When the tide changes, there's always three foot waves out there. And he took me out there and we went full bore through those waves. And he kept saying, watch the boat, watch the boat. And I could see how it would hit the wave and the boat would work, you know, and absorb the shock. And then we'd hit the next one and hit the next one. Then we zip around and then he made me do it. And he taught me how to trust the boat, and how to read the boat, and how to read the waves, and how you don't have to barge through like that. You can ride the wave. All those little things. And of course, those boats had shear pins on them, so if you hit the sediment, you had to take the boat apart and do the shear pin. You had to have, always have a piece of grass or a piece of fishing line to clean the pee hole out, because you'd hit the mud and have to clean the pee hole or the water pump wouldn't work. Lots and lots of practical knowledge like that that we learned from these caretakers that made, made Archie Carr write um, in my letter of recommendation that I was a very capable and creative field person because I could do that sort of stuff. And we did have to make stuff up. We had to, I, I mentioned once before, I was out with my coasterling and the boat broke. We had to hand paddle the boat all the way back to Seahorse Key against the tide. It was a terrible. <laughs> well, you were fortunate. Uh, I think you wore AD out because he wasn't near as helpful uh, later on, I don't think. No. He kind of just assumed we knew what we were doing. And Yeah, he, he was a fairly cantankerous guy. Could be. Yeah. I think the easiest guy to work with was Lee Belcher. He was a nice guy, young guy, quiet, but very cooperative with everything mm -hmm. he did. He was a good guy. Yeah, he was, uh, and, and he had long-term connections with Seahorse Key. He and his wife, Esta, had lived in Cedar Key. She had the island store over there, and uh, this was kind of a natural for him and uh, kept him gainfully employed probably at a time when he needed it, and he was so good. And he, he you know, we uh, the uh, things like hauling seawater, five-gallon carboys, to zoology in Gainesville. That was a weekly run, at least, with a whole van full of seawater rolling down the road, and yeah. you could bring them out here and fill them up so you can get clean seawater and then haul them back. Yeah. A.D. took me through this place. He bet me a six-pack of beer that I couldn't find five knot holes in the whole interior. 
because it's all made of heart cypress. And huh. it's really quite a well-constructed building. Great history. And did you have to buy them a six-pack of beer? I couldn't find any knot holes. And, and of course, Kenny and Rose have really fixed this place up beautifully. But back then, it was, it was pretty rough. And we would, there were always rats in the place and quite often squirrels. And we finally, the first year I was here, we built a cabinet on the south kitchen that had hardware cloth and the, all the food had to go in there. All the stuff that wasn't in the refrigerator had to go in there because the rats and the squirrels would get into it. And Mike Osterling and I came out one time and trapped a squirrel in the kitchen and it, I got on one side and Mike got on the other side and we both had a broom and we played about three rounds of squirrel hockey back and forth between us and then he opened the screen door and the squirrel shot out and you could hear it crashing down through the bushes <laughs> crash 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 and another time we came here and somebody had left a jar of peanut butter out and they worked on it long enough to get it unscrewed and the kitchen was covered with peanut butter footprints you know and so it was, it was rugged but it was an adventure we would have parties out here occasionally like when the cedar key when the cedar key festival was we would be out here we would drive our boats in to the festival at night and sit around a campfire and party away and then people that were graduate students but they didn't work out here would come back and we would all sleep out here and it was that was really cool because you'd drive back and it would be a crystal clear night with nothing but stars you know and the stars would be reflected in the water it was almost like driving through outer space because there's stars up and there's stars down and sometimes there would be phosphorescence in the water I know you've seen that I remember dropping a towel off the dock by accident and it was like it was covered with sequins as it drifted away because of the the dinoflagellates. It was a beautiful, beautiful place. We used to occasionally, the summer we were all here in 71, would swim in the basin down there at a high tide. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, just to watch someone swim out across there and uh, the phosphorescence uh, following them and that sort of thing. That's neat. Kind of neat. We had one memorable party up at up at uh, Seahorse. I think we all ended up over at Leonesta's afterwards, but uh, I had just, uh, we, we had it around one of the basins up there near the dock, and I just put uh, this new electronic marvel into my Volkswagen called an eight-track tape deck <laughs> <laughs> with speakers in the, in the doors, and uh, we listened to uh, Simon and Garfunkel all oh, night. Yeah, funny. so, fun. Yeah. Among other things. So a lot of times we would, like John did, we would collect out here and then go back to Gainesville um, as quickly as possible with our animals. And in fact, the very first paper I wrote was on the development of a brittle star that had unusual development. Most He's talking about Plutei, which are larvae that live in the plankton for a long time. But there are other larvae that don't stay in the plankton very long maybe three days and they're they have more yolk I actually thought at the time that that was an adaptation to the variable salinity in this area well I'd collect the brittle stars out here and put them in the back of my Volkswagen and drive back to Gainesville usually playing Rolling Stones or something get back to my office put them in a refrigerator at 20 degrees centigrade for which also turned out to be dark okay so they dark and cool pull them out and the females would immediately start spawning and when the females spawn then the males would spawn often it's the other way around that the females won't release eggs until they detect sperm in the water but this was different that was part of the paper I never could get those animals I, I spawned them three or four different times I never could get them to spawn if they didn't get the ride in the Volkswagen I brought a shaker out here. I actually brought a shaker out here and put them on the shaker for the same amount of time that I would have been driving and then put them in the refrigerator in the dark and pulled them out. Nothing happened. 
If, you know, see, my sand dollars were never quite that discerning. They just, you know, any anything, any shock, any any you know anything. They'd yeah, spawn. let's have a party. They spawn. Yeah. At that time, it would urchins were um, for years and years and years. They had been the material for looking at development of animals because they were easy to get to spawn. You just had to shoot them up with potassium chloride, and they would release their gametes if they were ripe. But starfish, sea cucumbers, and brittle stars didn't do that. And back in the 60s and 70s, nobody could get those animals to release their gametes. So the only way they got descriptions of development of those animals was if they happened to catch them spawning. They couldn't cause them to spawn. Now we've learned a lot of different chemical techniques, and we can pretty reliably spawn all those animals. But back then, it was very serendipitous. With Volkswagen, the assistance of a Volkswagen. With the assistance <laughs> of a Volkswagen, and possibly the stones, I don't know. Yeah, maybe that was it. <laughs> so I wanted to show you this um, article. There's a picture of Frank and 80 folks. And uh, it, it talks about uh, the interviewer asked um, 80 folks and uh, also interviewed his wife, Karen, and asked them about island living and so on. And I uh, show that to you in case you have any comment about it or any more that you'd like to say about 80 folks. So that was your roommate, wasn't it? That's yeah. Mike. That's Mike May. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's interesting. Um, well, when I was here, A.D. didn't live on the island. That was after you guys came out. Um, and Frank wouldn't come out so much. Do you have any specific questions you want to know? I hadn't seen this article. Okay. Uh, I don't believe I have any specific questions about it, just in general. If there's any other anecdotes that you had about uh, A.D., Karen, them living out here. You mentioned her old bottle collection that she had. Are there any other idiosyncrasies of them or their lifestyle here that you can remember? Not, not really. I mean, it was like they were to me. To me, they were a typical Cedar Key couple. She was very quiet, and he was pretty voluble, and he'd be out working all the time, and then he'd come drink a few beers and get pretty loud, you know, that sort of thing. But I always had really positive interactions with him, and on even on the, he went on a couple of our cruises with us, and uh, he was always helpful, knew what he was doing. It was good to have him there because you were using much heavier equipment, and he knew how to use all that fishing, fishing equipment. Somebody told me that he's now got a clam lease up around Caravel, so I, I haven't seen him in ages and ages. I think the summer we had so many people out here, we kind of uh, violated his space uh, a bit. Um, maybe rubbed him the wrong way. Cause, That's possible. Yeah, he, uh, I mean, it, it was a pleasant existence. It just, uh, uh, there were a, a couple of other students that uh, kind of had a hard time with him for some reason. I don't know whether it's the... Uh, well. Tom Rudiger was, a, folk was versus, the guy uh, that the city people, I don't know. And Tom was from New Jersey, and he was the guy that worked on the Ibis. So he would sit up there, and all of these trees had Ibis roosting in them. And their nests are placed just far enough that they can't hit one another. And he found out all kinds of neat stuff that the males would go off and collect sticks for the nest. And he found out that if the male was gone for more than a set period of time, like 10 minutes, the female would mate with the next door neighbor and you know, let the postman in. And the male would have to come back and that the, they would peck at each other and all, all kinds of stuff. But it was behavioral research. And A.D. had chickens. And Tom was convinced that the chickens, crowing and cackling, were messing up his research. And he wasn't one to hold back, you know. So he, I'm sure he complained pretty loudly. And then A.D. would get a little liquored up and get mad. And um, I, I think they had some pretty scary times. Well, I came out here, I came out here one time, uh, I think after, after 
the summer when we moved out here, or shortly thereafter, and and AD walked up and he and walked up and he said, "John, the chickens are dead." And I saw Tom kind of wide-eyed in the background. <laughs> Get over here. The chickens are dead, John. <laughs> They're gone. He, you know, he killed Karen's chickens. <laughs> so there was some fear that uh, AD was that they were really next. angry. <laughs> yeah, but Tom. Uh, Tom was convinced that those darn domestic chickens were messing up his uh, breeding ground uh, behavioral studies. And yeah. Maybe they were. Huh? Who, knows? Who knows? None of the birds are around now. Yeah, that's true. So, even 10 years ago, when we came back for the reunion, there were not pelicans nesting on that beach like there used to be. And almost all the nesting was way up in the north end of the island. And frigate birds never nested here, but you could you could see them displaying, you know, the males with their big red pouches, but I don't think they ever nested here. What are some other differences that you see on the island today versus when you came back for the reunion? And what year was that again? 2005 or six or seven? Yeah, I think it was like 2007 or, or six because mm -hmm. we just, we still have a souvenir cup and I just saw it the other day. I think yeah. it's about 10 years. Well, the island's getting built up a lot more, obviously, than when we were here. The yeah. lab is much nicer than when we were here. Mm -hmm. I mean, lab here at Seahorse? Yeah. yeah, there was a little building down there, but there wasn't very much in it. Um, and there were no water tables for running seawater. There were, there, in, were inside the building inside there, there were. were inside yeah. there were Not some outside water tables. There were. And uh, actually, it was a very nice uh, water table setup because the water was pumped up into a big tank and then you'd let it down so it was gravity fed and in many labs they've discovered when they pump the water in of course they super saturate it with air and then when it comes out in the aquarium the air bubbles out and kills the animals it gets on their gills or it gets in for brittle stars it gets in their guts and all of a sudden they're floating around but this gravity fed system worked really nicely for keeping animals, and I think it still does. Um, the water's, when the salinity's high, the water's pretty pristine. And you all mentioned when we first arrived that even though this is not the breeding time of the year, that historically, even 10 years ago when you were here, but also when you were here working, that there were significantly more birds around even on this part of the island? I haven't seen any cormorants. There are always cormorants everywhere on every piling and there are up at Steenhatchy, but I don't see cormorants. That sand point you go around when you first come in always had terns, gulls, cormorants, and pelicans on it. And the boat would come in and they would all take off and then fly back. On a low tide like this, that's where they would be and there weren't any. On the other hand, 10 years ago when I came back here, or when Rudiger came back when we came out, there were three or four bald eagles. And I never saw bald eagles before that. But bald eagle populations have recovered a lot in the last 20 or 30 years. So now there's some bald eagles nesting. And there were always ospreys. I mean, I've never been out here without an osprey chirping away somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, So, I, yeah, the bird population is distinctly reduced. Well, remind me, Steve, even this time of year, uh, or outside of nesting season, I, I seem to recall there were always some kind of birds around. I mean, yeah, yeah. Sand Point, but up in the trees here or around here somewhere? Yeah. Well, and, and Maybe the, remnants of an older population. And juveniles. I mean, the yeah. adults would go away and the juveniles would still be here for a long time, feeding on the flats and places yeah. like that. Yeah. And, uh, well, like I said, cormorants all the time. And now you're going to start seeing loons, lots of loons and ducks will be on the water pretty soon coming down. You mentioned before the summer trips with Frank Maturo. Could you talk a little bit about your experience with some of those summer trips? Yeah, the summer cruises you mean. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, after I left they actually had summer courses out here. So undergraduate students um, would come out here and stay for s several weeks. And apparently it was quite successful. They loved it and they, 
they would basically do what we did. They would go around and collect and identify animals, and then they would all have to pick a project and, and do a project. And then they would, marine labs almost all have a volleyball net outside. And in the afternoon, after all the work is done, everybody goes out and plays volleyball before dinner. And they had volleyball set up out here for the kids. And, um, There's the post right there. Yeah, and that, it was, I mean, I've talked to, at the reunion, I talked to a lot of people that either helped teach those classes. Have you met Mike Marshall? Okay, he's, he's probably a good guy for you to try to talk to. Um, they enjoyed it, and the students talked about it was the adventure of a lifetime for them to come live on an island for two or three weeks. You know, even in the hot summertime, it was an adventure. What we would do is we would come out here for field trips and then go back, um, and then we would do these cruises that um, the state... University Systems Institute of Oceanography had a series of vessels and you could sign up for the vessels and basically we would go and dredge further offshore or on certain transects to uh, see fauna that we never saw here you know that that was deeper sea stuff more tropical stuff when you got down to the Keys by then most of us had learned to scuba dive so there were a couple of those trips where we got to the Keys and actually dove for a little bit of time. And the sampling devices were big dredges that dragged along the bottom. Not, these boats were about as big as shrimp boats, but they didn't have shrimp nets or doors on them. We usually used either a, a kind of a trawl um, or a, something like a big scallop dredge, which is really good for bringing up benthic fauna. Did you just sign up for the time, or did you have to have a, a project idea that would have to then be vetted in order to gain your spot? He would sign up for the time, okay. and it would be basically associated with his course. So he would say, I'm teaching in the spring. Um, we would like to do a cruise sometime during that semester, and they would look on their calendar and say, okay, you can have the boat from this time to this time, and they would schedule the boat. And they. The boat would have its own crew. It would have its own captain, usually a captain and a mate. One time AD acted as the mate, you know, saved the university money. And I think they did that with all the other universities. Nova had trips. Miami actually had trips. I know they took a boat out of Tallahassee once. And for us, it was our oceanographic experience because this is all shallow water, shallow water stuff. You mentioned the drag tortugas trip. Before. Right. Twice so I went on one. That, that was the Bellows. And we went all the way to the Tortugas. And, of course, we stayed on the boat, but we were able to walk around and walk around the, the fort. Um, and then the next day we came into the Keys. And somebody like Lee or um, once it was the animal collector, Buck would drive a van down and we'd meet the van in the Keys and drive home and the boat would go on to its next stop. So it was a great, it was a great experiment or experience for biologists because we would see all kinds of new stuff on a nice big, big boat. I heard somebody was mentioning that the UF boat now, the Discovery, are you familiar with it? I'm not. Are you? Not. That, that boat had been taken by Frank on some trip. Were you, are you? I'm not familiar with that. That must be the third or fourth large boat, and I don't even know how he got how he got them. But they got bigger, and then you could go off. And as John Page worked on um, nudibranchs, and he would have to dive for his material. So after we all learned to dive, we would take the urchin or whatever boat there was, and we would go, you know, ten miles out off Seahorse Reef or something like that and dive. For me, that was really scary because you couldn't see that far. And you knew... <laughs> water clarity was horrible. The water yeah. clarity was horrible and the first thing that would go swimming by you was a remora. And you'd say, oh, what was that attached to? <laughs> and of course, all the I remember being stuff. out there one time crawling on my hands and knees on the bottom because I couldn't 
you know, I just kind of was doing oh, like yeah. this because I couldn't see. Sometimes in Cedar Key area, you get a layer on the bottom of very, very fine sediment that just stays there. So that we would go, you couldn't tell from the surface. So we would go out there and John Page would jump in the water and swim down to see if it was clear enough to collect. And of course, you're in a buddy system and you jump in the water and immediately John takes off to go collect his animals and like that, you're alone. You know, your buddy is gone and you have no idea where he is. I got stranded out there once. I came up and the boat was 500 yards away. And I, w I had my weight belt and a snorkel and I started trying to swim back and I couldn't exchange enough air. And a lot of times it was the, w the winter time. Mm -hmm. It was and, winter time. Uh, my, uh, in those days, all I, the only wetsuit I could afford was a long sleeve sweatshirt, which, <laughs> which <laughs> tend to drag you down even more. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's right. And I actually got to the point where I thought I was going to have to drop the weight belt because I was getting so exhausted. And then finally Lee saw me. And I mean, that was kind of cowboy diving, you know. The, can't do that very much anymore. No, it wasn't very good. good. But yeah, we weren't the safest people. Mostly Paige wasn't because he would just be gone. Oh yeah, John would get excited about, wow, look at these. All He'd be just taking off and trying to find Trying them. to find his nudibranchs. And, yeah. And wouldn't pay attention to where his buddy was. And since the water visibility was so bad, you either, if you did anything, I mean, you took your eyes off, then he was gone. The only thing you could do is kind of follow him. But we did that for a couple of years, a lot of diving like yeah. that. I wish I'd known more because I think it's a really, really interesting environment out there. And like Kenny was showing us uh, how they're looking for hard bottom, you know, because hard bottom is where things hang up. So they're surveying. It's a, we, would, we would find places that would be hard bottom. I have all kinds of stuff on them. And then we'd go out two months later and they'd be gone because the sand shifts so much. It exposes and then covers, exposes and covers. So they're really interesting temporary habitats. You mentioned earlier on in the interview you studied under Archie Carr. Right. What was that like? What was Archie Carr like? Oh, that was the best experience, I think, of, of my life. He was a wonderful person. And at, when I was at the University of Colorado, and I got accepted to Florida, and one of my friends who was in the biology department said, oh, that's where Archie Carr is. Like, Who's Archie Carr? I had no idea who Archie Carr was. Um, he's a turtle guy. And so as soon as I got here, I read the Windward Road, and I lived in a little place um, north of the university, in a little one-room place, and I got here in September, and I was so scared, I didn't have an assistantship. I was taking five courses and studying like mad, but I would carve time out to read. And I remember distinctly sitting in that little place with one of these classic, classic Florida thunderstorms, which you don't get in Colorado with the rain just pouring down and lightning booming and the trees blowing and reading Windward Road, his, his book, and just being fascinated. And then after my first assistantship was basically, um, if you want to identify certain flatworms, you have to cut them and you have to slice them. And in order to do that, you have to go through this procedure called embedding, which they do with us too. When they do a biopsy, they basically, you embed something in paraffin and then you cut it in sections and then you stain it. When he had all of these samples taken from right after the depression and then he became an administrator and now he was retiring and wanted to go back and do that so they found money for me to section which was good because I didn't know how to do it so it was another skill I learned and then when that ran out Archie hired me basically my job was to feed the turtles that he had in the lab which he would show to NSF people when they came and to um, keep track of the tag returns because they would tag turtles at Tortuguero in the summertime and then when fishermen caught them or found them they could send the tag back to Florida 
and get a cash reward. And we would record where the turtle, turtle was captured. So it was a really easy assistantship. And he was such a unique individual. Uh, he always wore khakis and all of his shirts were long sleeve shirts that he rolled up. He had one withered arm, which I didn't even know for like six months. I never even noticed, but he'd always carry his arm like that. He always, once a year, he ordered all his stuff from L.L. Bean, and that's what he would wear. And um, I took his field ecology course, and that was fascinating because he would take us to different places in Florida and talk about natural history. And walking around behind Archie Carr and hearing him talk about Florida natural history was you, the most wonderful thing for a young biologist to do in the world. Once we were at Lake George and he was talking about this and talking about how it had changed and he was drinking a, a Coke, a can of Coke. And as we left, he tossed the Coke into the lake. And I was appalled absolutely appalled and I thought there has to be a reason there has to be a reason he must be doing that to to make a place for fish to live or something like that and all the way back to Gainesville I struggled with that and I finally said Dr. Carr I gotta ask you you threw that can of coke in the in the water why'd you do that and he went oh young Stancic caught me polluting <laughs> And he had just unconsciously done that. And, but, and then I got to go down to Torchiguero and work on the turtle projects. And that was unique because his wife would be down there and she would have us going through three by five cards of all the tag returns. Um, there was a young woman named Jane Frick who was trying to repopulate turtles in Bermuda and she would often be there. His one or two or of his, or sometimes three of his sons would be there. And of course, we'd all be following Jane around. And we would all have dinner together at the big house. And as soon as we were done eating, people would be sitting around talking. Archie would leave and he would be wandering around. He, he can make frog sounds. One of the things he wrote um, as his, he tried to get into World War II and he filled a form out and one of the skills he wrote was he couldn't imitate any frog in Florida. And he would walk around, twerk, tweet, twerk, twerk, and we'd be having this conversation. All of a sudden, he'd be at the window, he'd make a comment, and then he'd be gone again. And he was just peripatetic like that, walking around, listening to the conversation, but not just sitting in the room. He was an exceptional person, really fun, nice, personable guy. I, I took his community ecology class, and it was kind of a seminar course. And, you know, if graduate students would stand up, we'd probably present idiotic things to him. But anyway, uh, uh, he would sit back and grade papers and make those sounds uh -huh. while someone was talking. Well, yeah. he didn't on mine because he fell asleep. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, he was uh, very um, respectful, interesting, nice guy. I didn't have the experiences with him that you did. I remember I think he hosted a zoology picnic down at his place one time and uh, my wife and I went down and he was out and he came out and he said let me show you something have you seen I know you people aren't from the south but have you seen and he went over and uh, uh, grabbed a leaf off a magnolia leaf off a magnolia tree or something like that and broke it and he held up my wife and said here here smell this and uh, well that's kind of nice uh, by that evening her whole face had broken out <laughs> she never forgot Ar Archie Carr <laughs> Uh, he did. He never knew that. But uh, what mm -hmm. an interesting guy, though. Are you really, done? Yeah, Is amazing. it off? He had. He had. He lived on a pond there, and if you've read some of his stuff, he had a female alligator that lived there, and they also, when his kids were little, they had a giant um, snapping turtle. I mean, a really big snapping turtle, and the kids had glued jewels all over its back. And he could go down to the edge of the pond and whistle, and the turtle would come. And he did that at one of those those parties, you know, whistled, and all of a sudden this monster comes climbing with these plastic red and blue and green jewels glued onto its back from when the little kids were down there. 
Mm. Yeah, very interesting guy. Taught me a lot. He spoke Spanish. And when you read The Windward Road, one of the reasons he did that, because he had spent part of his post-PhD life being a hunter for crews that were logging in Nicaragua. And he actually wrote a book called High Jungles and Low um, about that experience. And the crews would go through and build the road, and then he would come through afterwards. So it was untouched jungle that had just been opened up. And a day later, he would be there. And then a, five or six days later, the crew would come in, the line crew or the power line crew or whatever would come in. So he was walking in these cleared paths in pure jungle and seeing all kinds of wonderful stuff. And he was the meat hunter for the, for the crew. And so he really learned Spanish and he learned, he taught me, just like fishermen here, if you really want to know what's going on, you have to talk to the fishermen. You know, they may have a lot of legends, but they also know a lot of natural history. Just like you and I were talking about the crab, that crab, and how everybody had a different name for it, but they knew, they knew when it came and they knew when it left. And he taught, he, that's how he found that turtle nesting ground, was by talking to the natives until he finally came across it. You know, and it really taught me that they're in a different, economic class, different educational class, but they're to be respected. And they have a lot of knowledge that you don't have. And if you're nice, they're nice. A.D. had that. He had a lot of uh, kind of common sense, general uh, understanding, knowledge, uh, kind of a country explanation for what he was yeah. seeing, but he, he knew the timing of things. Yeah, yeah. He had always had an explanation to why those things occurred and that sort of thing, so. Yeah. Well, I think you work with fishermen, so you know that there's, there's a tremendous amount of knowledge they have. Some things they're wrong about, but not very many, and it's just their interpretation. Well, good. Thank you both. Yeah, before we get cut off, let's yeah. It's in there. Thank you so much. Okay. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. Mm -hmm.